Praise God. Um, I got to connect with these guys a little bit. They got here at about 3.35 before um, church really got going and shared a little bit with them already. Um, but you guys, um, some of y'all know my story and my testimony, but I grew up in Texas. I'm from Houston originally, um, and I went down the road about an hour and a half to go to college in College Station, Texas at Texas A&M University, uh, class of 2005, and um, Jesus changed my life as a college student in Aggieland. I didn't grow up in a church home. I was a broken kid, broken home, and honestly, I went off to college um, to uh, have a good time, and uh, Jesus interrupted um, my plan with his mercy um, and transformed my life when I was a freshman in college. And there wasn't an Antioch College Station uh, when I was there. That came about nine years later. But God changed my life a second time when I started attending Antioch Community Church in College Station, where all these guys have come from. Um, because I had never been a part of a church that was, Jesus said it like this in John chapter four, you know, the woman at the well, and she's like, well, my people said we worship at the mountain over there, and your people say we worship at the temple. And she's kind of asking Jesus, where's the right place to go to church? And in classic Jesus fashion, he doesn't answer her question about where should we go to church. He answers a question about how you should worship. And he says, I'm telling you, a time is coming. Well, neither on the mountain or in the temple will you worship the Father, for the Father is seeking true worshipers that will worship in spirit. Someone say spirit. spirit. And in truth. Someone say truth. truth. And I had never been a part of a church that was wholeheartedly going after both. Right. Um, and until I met some people from Antioch and College Station, Texas, and, and it transformed my life. Um, it doesn't matter where you go to church. It matters how you go to church. And we're unashamedly um, trying to build a spirit and truth church right here in Salt Lake City. And I just want to say thank you guys again for the sacrifice, the time. I mean, can we just, quick show of hands, you, you only slept an hour or less on the bus last night. Like, because that would be me. I'm terrible. I feel you. I, I am terrible at sleeping unless I'm in my cozy bed. And I, so two hours or less, just wave at me. Three hours of less or sleep. Okay, four hours or less. Okay, so wave at me if you're like a miracle worker and you slept five hours or more on the bus. That, okay, wow, wow. The true revivalists right there. Hey, truly though, um, on behalf of our church family, like, we are so honored to have you in our city. We, we desperately need the gospel here. And thank you, thank you, thank you. It's gonna be more fun than you're expecting. I believe the Lord's saying it's gonna be more fruitful than any of us are expecting. Um, and I want you to know it already has been you being here. Thank you. I got prophesied over by Noah and, uh, and Brady already. So I'm ready to preach, fellas, come on. We are in a teaching season uh, called Show Us Your Glory, and I just want to do a very quick recap. This heart cry that we see in Exodus 33, where Moses was, was leaning in, his forefathers had known God as El Shaddai. They had known him as the, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, but when God sent him into this assignment in Egypt, he said, I'm gonna need to know your name. I'm gonna need to know more. And there was this leaning in of Moses and this beautiful heart cry of, God, show me who you are. And last week, um, I, I shared with us, if you missed the message, I believe it's an important one to go and, and catch up on, but just quick re recap. I shared with us that a lot has happened since Exodus 33. When God had to cover Moses in the cleft of the rock, right, and pass by him and say, well, you can just, you can kind of see me as I trail off. A lot has happened. And the resounding message of the New Testament in the day and age where we live now to this heart cry, the resounding response from the Lord to show us your glory is him saying, I have. 
I have shown what we saw. Let's put John 1, 14. The word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory. Uh, I know the Aggies in the room are really smart, probably really, you know, top 10%, you know. Uh, that's not a joke. It's hard to get into Aggie land these days, all right? We have, what tense is that in, college students? Okay, so, so we have seen, he has shown it to us. It's there. And it's the glory as of the only son from the father, full, someone say full, full of grace and truth. John bore witness about him and cried out, this was he of whom I said, he who comes after me ranks before me because he was before me. He goes on and says, next slide please, for from his, there's that word again, fullness. Are you catching this? We have all received, past tense, grace upon grace. For the law was given through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God. The only God or the only begotten who is at the Father's side, he has, past tense, made him known. So Jesus, through John chapter 1, the New Testament is saying God has shown us the fullness of his glory when he sent Jesus in grace and truth. We see that Jesus himself in John 17, verse 3, he prayed this. He prayed in John 17, 3. He said, this is eternal life that they what? Know they know you, the only true God in Jesus Christ whom you have sent. I glorified you on earth having accomplished the work that you gave me to do. So what we talked about last week that John 17 was before the cross, and in John 17, Jesus himself said, I accomplished the mission. Now, you're not, I'm not going to argue. Yes, him dying on the cross, resurrecting was a huge part of his mission and breakthrough. But are you seeing what I'm seeing here? Before that happened, he said, I've accomplished what I came here to do. Because what he came here to do was what? Glorify the Father and show us the fullness. Someone we'll say fullness. The fullness of God. So where we landed last week was that the fullness of redemptive history, the culmination of God's re revelation throughout time was Jesus showing us the Father and then showing us the Father laying down his life for the family. I submitted to us that redeemed fathers leading redeemed families is actually the great fight of faith of our day. And I wanna say something before we move on that I wish I would have said last week to balance out that message. But after that night, I went home and I was just simmering. I, I do believe that to be true, that redeemed fathers leading redeemed families is the fight of faith in 21st century America today. I believe that all of hell is trying to destroy marriage, family, and children. And I believe it is a unique battle for our fathers and our families to, to, to lean in, fight the good fight of faith, and lead the salt of the, be the salt of the earth. But as I went home, um, I wish, this was on my heart, I want to just share it with you now. Jesus was single. And Jesus built family as a single man. He gave his whole life away over the course of three years to these brothers and these, these sons that he imparted his whole life to. And as a single man, Jesus in three years turned the world upside down. So I just want to balance what I said last week. I do believe fathers and families, it is a critical call at a critical hour. And if that's not where you're at right now, go change the world as a single person, please. All right. So we're going to continue out of Hebrews 1. So you can flip in your Bible to Hebrews 1, um, where we, Connor, I love that you shared that verse. That's where we're starting again this morning, that Jesus came to reveal the Father, and we're just going to sit here for a few weeks and lean into, okay, so what is the Father like? This is, from the very beginning, this teaching season is just about the attributes of God, which again, have not been hidden from us. They've actually been revealed. And of all people in history, we have this incredible privilege to live in a time where the fullness of God has been revealed. 
And so I said last week, anybody want to have an encounter with the fullness of the glory of God? Yes. Go read the Gospels. <laughs> Because history has preserved for us the picture of Jesus, which the word of God itself says is the fullness of his glory. Are you with me? Yeah. It's awesome. Me and my son started reading through John one chapter a morning. We just felt like, let's do it. Let's go. And it's been so fun to wake up and sit around with my boys, two eight-year-old boys and a 10-year-old, and, and we're just looking at Jesus and, and going, this is his glory. You know, just like, let it be fresh to us again. It's been super sweet. So today, um, let's pick it back up in Hebrews 1. And we're going to be leaning into um, an attribute of God that I believe is going to mark us today in a new way. Um, it is one of the, there are many things that make him God. But as we're going to get into this study this morning, I think what we're going to see is this one um, is like essential to his godness. And I said to our team as we were praying earlier, I just want to build your expectation a little bit for today. I said to our team earlier, just, just rose up in my heart, I feel like this is like a BC, AD kind of a day for our church family. What I mean by this is like, you know, before Christ, you know, it's like there's going to be Antioch, Salt Lake City, before March 10th, 2024, and then like Antioch, Salt Lake City after. So I, I really feel like, um, and I, I want you to know this isn't, oh, because Chris prayed and got a word. Like this is our staff team has been seeking the Lord. Our elder team, there's a unity in, in what we are bringing to you. I'm just kind of the mouthpiece for something that the spirit of God was like shouting us down. And I believe it's like a BC, AD kind of day, so just get excited, because he's coming for us. He's coming for us in his love, uh, and, and it's in, in his weight, because glory actually biblically means weight. It means heaviness. I've never been more excited to bring a weighty word to you, church, but weight changes us, and he wants, he's after us today in his love. But Hebrews 1, verse 1, long ago, at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son, whom he appointed the heir of all things, through whom also he created the world. He is the radiance of the glory of God. There it is again. The exact imprint of his nature. And he, Jesus, upholds the universe by the word of his power. After making purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, having become as much superior to angels as the name he has inherited is more excellent than theirs. And then he goes into a few verses here where he starts to really exalt the supremacy of Jesus, the Son, over even the angelic created beings. And he says in verse 5, For to which of the angels did God ever say, You are my Son, today I have begotten you. Or again, I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a Son, verse six, and again, when he brings the firstborn into the world, he says, let all God's angels worship him. But of the angels, he says, he makes his angels winds, his ministers a flame of fire. But of the son, he says, are you seeing this? He's setting his son apart, the supremacy of Jesus. And of the son, he says, your throne O oh God, is forever and ever. The scepter of uprightness is the scepter of your kingdom. Next slide. You have loved righteousness and hated wickedness. Therefore, God, your God, has anointed you with the oil of gladness beyond your companions. Church, tonight we are looking at Jesus and we are looking at 
how Jesus loves righteousness and how his righteousness, let's go back one slide, is the scepter of his kingdom. The scepter was held in the king's hand. It was a symbol of his royal authority. And do you notice that the scepter of uprightness, just a a synonym for righteousness, is the scepter of the kingdom of God. Jesus loves righteousness. Church, are you seeing the word of God tonight? This is our God. This is who he is. You want to see the fullness of the glory of God? Look at Jesus. What is Jesus all about? What does he love? He loves righteousness and he hates wickedness. And we need to understand biblically that this is foundational. And when I say this, I mean righteousness is foundational to his throne. You saw that the scepter of the kingdom, who who rules over a kingdom? A king. What's a king sit on? He's sitting on a throne. And you may have noticed, go back one slide for me, okay? That your throne, O God, is forever and ever. And you're sitting on this throne. And the scepter of of uprightness is in your hand. And you love righteousness. And what we're going to see in a few more scriptures I want to share is that Righteousness is foundational to the ruling and reigning authority of God. It is what makes him God. It is what makes him king. It is what makes him good and worthy, and worthy to be trusted, worthy to be followed, worthy to be adored, is that he loves righteousness. We're going to unpack this for a little bit. Here's what we're doing tonight. We are going to examine this attribute of God, his righteousness and his love for righteousness, and then we're going to let it examine us. So Psalm 9, 7 through 8 says, the Lord sits enthroned, someone say enthroned, forever. He has established his throne for justice. Look at verse 8. He judges the world with, say it church, righteousness. He judges the people with uprightness. The scepter of his kingdom is the scepter of uprightness. Did you see the connection again between his throne and righteousness? Psalm 89 14 just comes out and says it. Righteousness and justice are the foundation of your throne. Steadfast love and faithfulness go before you. Look at Psalm 11. By the way, all these scriptures and this, this message, my, the notes are on our blog. Many of you guys know how to find it. You can find it there um, if you want to go. You don't have to furiously take notes. It's all there online. Um, Psalm 11, look at this. The Lord is in his holy temple. Here, here it is again. The Lord's throne is in heaven. His eyes see, his eyelids test the children of man. The Lord tests the righteous. Are you seeing this? But his soul hates the wicked and the one who loves justice, or loves, sorry, loves violence. Let him rain coals on the wicked. Fire and sulfur and a scorching wind shall be the portion of their cup for the Lord is, say it with me, church, righteous. He loves righteous deeds, and the upright shall what? Come and behold him. Okay? Shall see his face. Jesus said it like this. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall. Are you seeing the Bible is, is showing us something about the nature of God, the nature of his throne. Are you seeing? I just, I just gave you a sample of a few scriptures that there's this biblical connection between the throne of God, his authority, and his righteousness. And that was, you know, wow, let him rain coals on the wicked, fire and sulfur and scorching wind. 
I just want us to see this isn't isolated language. Proverbs 6, 16, we said the Lord loves righteousness and he hates wickedness. Proverbs 6 says there are six things that the Lord hates. Actually, seven. He's like, oh, thank, okay, maybe there's one more. You know, it's always funny. I love that when Proverbs done that. There's six things that the Lord hates, seven that are an abomination. Okay, so he's gonna list seven things that God hates. Can we, okay, I know this is getting heavy fast. Can we just like, listen, do you have some things that you love? Can we just, let, let's just bring it, let's just bring it light for a minute, okay? You have some foods that you love? Yeah. Yeah. Do you have some foods that you hate? Yeah. Okay. There are things as a created being that you enjoy, things that please you, things that you love, and things that you don't like, and things that you would actually say, I hate that. And you need to know, you were made in the image of God. And God's a, a person, a being. And, and he has things he loves, and friends, he has things he hates. And he actually tells us a lot of what they are. Haughty eyes, that's pride. A lying tongue, deception. And hands that shed innocent blood. Oh, we need to hear that one in America 2024. A heart that devises wicked plans. Feet that make haste to run to evil. A false witness who breathes out lies, more deception. And one who sows discord among brothers. Hey, let this help us out. Like, like God loves righteousness and he hates wickedness. And there are things that he despises that are an abomination to him. Psalm 145, 17, again, the Lord is righteous in all his ways and kind in all his works. Why does he love things and why does he hate things? Because he's righteous. I wanna unpack this word. Righteous just means to be just, right, clean, correct, lawful, true, or straight. It is staying on the straight way. The opposite of righteous is crooked. I'm gonna say it again. Righteous, to be righteous, is just, right, clean, correct, lawful, true, or straight. This word in the Hebrew can speak of government. The job of government, if you don't know biblically, is actually to uphold what is just and right and clean and correct and lawful and true. That's the job of God-delegated authorities. It can speak of your cause or of your conduct or of your character. But the picture is that God is a just judge and he dispenses justice and he fulfills his promises because he's morally clean and right and good and he always loves the right things at the right, in the right way at the right time. And he always hates the wrong thing. He hates the right things too. You know what I'm saying? He loves the right things, and he hates the right things, which are the wrong things. Are you with me? Yes. And this word righteous, I, I'm like a, a, I go to Bible Gateway, and I'm just like, I love doing word studies and just figuring out. Bible Gateway is a great one. Blue letter Bible, you can get into the Hebrew language. And, and so just, you know, righteous is like in the top five most repeated words, other than the word Lord, which is like seven to 8,000 times in the Bible, and like all the these and an and the, you know, all the little articles. But so it's just to give you a little context, the word good appears in the Bible 690 times in the Eng our English Bible. The word evil appears 539 times. You should know that your Bible delineates between good and evil. The word love appears 684 times in the Bible. The word hate, 169 times. The word righteous appears 535 times in the Bible. The word wicked appears 363 times. 
from Old to New Testament, you should know that God loves righteousness and he hates wickedness. And so I am gonna ask us tonight as we continue leaning in that we let God be God. This is who he is. He gets to define who he is. He gets to set forth the terms of his character and we get to decide if we will accept him on his own terms. But I wanna submit to us that we let God be God and not be offended, as, as Jesus said, and walk away. Last week, we talked about progressive Christianity and how what progressive Christianity in the progressive church is trying to do in our day is actually God's revealed the fullness, actually, of his glory, and progressive Christianity is coming along saying, we're gonna actually remove pieces of his character that don't suit us or our preferences or our and so I just need you to know the fact that God uh, loves righteousness, hates wickedness, and that he distinguishes clearly between the two is one of the first bricks that the progressive church goes for. and says, no. And I'm gonna tell you, the brick that they try to replace it with is this word of tolerance. No, 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 he doesn't actually, there's not things that he loves and hates he just kind of tolerates it all. And maybe they go and rewrite the scene around the throne of God, which remember the foundations of his throne are righteousness and justice. And there's these angels around the throne and what they're singing of our king is holy, holy, holy. And that's another brick right after righteous is let's remove that one. And, and maybe what they're actually singing is he's just love, love, love. And this is, this is the day and age we live in. And, and I just want us to be aware, the spirit of the age is relativism, which basically means anything goes, except for having the conviction that not anything goes. So, no, no, listen, in a room this big, there are some of us in here that you you're 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 strugg you've struggled with this or you're or you you need to you're like yeah what do you mean not anything goes isn't that like this i do do you i'll do me you do you it's just but what i want to help us understand like that we're going to let god be god that is that is not how he rolls <laughs> that's not who he is the spirit of the age is relativism. Anything goes except for having a conviction that not anything goes. And if you take a stand and you say, no, 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 it's not, it's not anything goes, then you're, you're a bigot or you're hateful or you're, and, and you get crucified by the spirit of the age for having a conviction. As a people of God, we have to understand there are things that the Lord hates. And God's, God's word makes a clear distinction between righteousness and wickedness. And we're living in days where the world is rising up and calling evil good and good evil. And I, I, I want us to know, if we are not careful, church, we can be swept into the current of culture. And I say this just in, like, it's with a sobriety, like we can be deceived. Because you know what it means to be deceived? It means to be tricked. It means like you don't realize that you're deceived. Okay, so I, dear brothers and sisters of ours that maybe sat next to us in church five years ago, some of them, this has already happened. Okay? And, and, and they're, they're taking bricks out of the nature of God and we need to be open to the possibility that there are areas in our lives where maybe we've been deceived. And just to define deception, it, it, like that list of there's these things that God hates and then there's things that God lo loves. If you're on the flip side of that and you're like, man, I think I'm finding in my life that there's some things in my life that God actually says he hates, but you don't think it's a problem, you're deceived. So... Um, 
I want to just pause real quick. So back to the Hebrews 1 verse, if we could, the scepter of his kingdom, remember that, is righteousness. He loves righteousness and he hates wickedness. And the very next verse says, let's go to the next slide there, that he loved righteousness, he hated wickedness. And so look what God did. Look what the fruit of loving righteousness is. God has anointed you with the oil of gladness. So look at your neighbor and say, joy. How many could use a little extra dose of joy in your life? Okay, everyone that lives in Salt Lake City, if you're not waving your hand, you're lying. Okay, I forgive you. All right? Listen, I just want to be really honest here. I've been here two and a half years. And my experience with believers and the body of Christ here in this valley, I would not regularly describe as people that are very joyful. Look, I know it's hard here. I know it's different here. Okay, but I also know that Jesus is anointed with the oil of gladness. And so actually what's been in my heart for weeks is a message about joy. But as the Lord led us back to this passage this week, the Lord said to me, or what I sensed the Spirit saying was, Chris, joy is a fruit. The fruit of the Spirit. Righteousness is the root. Okay. Did you see that loving righteousness was the root? And from that place, therefore, he was anointed with joy. So some of us have a peace and joy problem but it might actually be that we have a righteousness problem. Because in, even in, well, let me just make a couple connections here. Psalm 35, verse 27, Old Testament says, let those who delight in my righteousness shout for joy and be glad forevermore. Great is the Lord who delights in the welfare of his servant. This saying, God wants you to be full of joy and for your life to be marked with gladness. But guess what? If you don't love righteousness, you'll never get there. Because righteousness is the root. Loving righteousness is the root. And the fruit is joy. In the New Testament, Romans 14, 17 says it like this. Again, the scepter of the kingdom. It says the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking, but of righteousness, peace, and joy and the Holy Spirit. The New Testament has told us, you want to know what the kingdom of God is? It starts in righteousness. It flows out into peace and joy. Now, there are other root issues But we have to understand fundamentally that there is no lasting peace and joy that's not built upon righteousness. The righteous ways of God are the paths to life. And thanks to the new covenant, what I want to tell us today as I preach the gospel to us again is that we can actually live in the paths of righteousness in a sustainable, lasting way of victory. Salvation, the reason Jesus came, the reason Jesus had to bleed and die, the reason why we just sang that beautiful, oh, the cross, what you've done is more than enough. He came, because we all... He came to die because we all had, I say had because if you're in Christ now, it's a past tense thing for you, but we all had a righteousness problem. Romans, the word righteousness in the New Testament, 42 times in the book of Romans. Romans is Paul's Magna Carta on the grace of God, salvation, and how the righteous shall live by faith. The New Covenant gospel is None of you are righteous. None of us. We all have a righteousness problem without Jesus. But the solution of the new covenant is that Jesus came to make you righteous by his blood. And day one that you put your faith in his blood, your righteousness problem gets solved. 1 Peter 2, 24, and it's all at the cross. Look at this. He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree. Why? That we might die to sin and what, church? Live. 
live to righteousness. For by his wounds, you have been healed. You were straying like sheep. You all had a righteousness problem, but now have returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. Friends, grace, the grace of God, the blood of Jesus, it answers our righteousness problem. On the cross, he took all of your unrighteousness on himself and he bore it. And he, he received the judgment of your sin and mine. He received it as a substitute in our place. So that we could die and live again. The New Testament picture of salvation is nothing less than a radical rebirth. It is a supernatural miracle. It is not trying harder to be righteous. That only makes your righteousness problem worse. It is recognizing I'm not righteous. But he himself bore my sin in his body on the tree so that I could die to my old way of sin and live to righteousness. This is grace. And so what happens is, and many of you already stand this, but look, we can't go forward unless we're like crystal clear on the gospel right now. We all have a righteousness problem, but when we trust in him on the tree, when we trust in his blood, day one, he removes your righteousness problem. And the nature of salvation, or justification, the theologians calls it, is he looks at you day one that you trust in him, and he declares you to be what, church? Righteous. Day one. Day one. The second you trust in his blood, righteous. This is why it's such good news. But, but it's not just that he's speaking something over you. He is resurrecting something in you. You really died to your old way so that you could really live to be who he says you were day one in his blood, righteous. This is the gift. Romans 15 says this. Um, 1517, he's, he's comparing Adam and Jesus and how Adam was, uh, let's get Romans, we got it up there, Romans 517. Oh, sorry, I think we missed it. Here we go. If because of one man's trespass, Adam, okay, death reigned, someone say reign. reign. Death reigned through Adam, much more will those who receive, look at your neighbor, say receive. Why do I have to receive it, church? Because it is a free gift. So if you receive the abundance of grace, oh, come on, look at this. This is so exciting. And the free gift of righteousness. Man, some of y'all need to get excited about your salvation again today. And some of my friends that came out of the Mormon church are clapping and cheering the loudest. Because look, they tried righteousness in their own strength. And it doesn't work. And they came to understand that all they had to do was receive this free gift of righteousness. So look, under Adam, where sin entered and then sin reigned, through Jesus, righteousness enters so that we can reign in life. From the very beginning, there's a story, this isn't my notes, but there's a story in Genesis where God says to Cain, the whole Cain and Abel, he says, Cain, sin is crouching at your door and its desire is to rule over you. Friends, we need to understand this great salvation in the blood of Jesus. Death and sin 
used to reign over us. In the blood, you receive this gift of righteousness so that you can reign in life with Jesus, including, as Romans 6 teaches, reigning over sin. I'm gonna preach to you tonight the deliverance of the gospel. The deliverance of the gospel. Galatians 1, I don't have these scriptures up there. Galatians 1 said that Jesus gave himself to deliver us from the present evil age, not leave us in it struggling. 2 Peter 1 says his divine power has given me everything that I need to escape the corruption that's in the world because of lust, not stay trapped in it. Colossians 1.13 says that he delivered me, someone say delivered, from the domain of darkness and he transferred me into the kingdom of his son so that I could die to that realm, to sin and death, and live in righteousness. God has delivered us in the gospel. He has made us righteous. This is the good news. And I need to apologize to you on, a, on behalf of some bad preachers and bad pastors and hack Bible teachers that told you that even though Jesus delivered you, rescued you with his own blood, and brought you into the kingdom of God to be free, that you're just gonna struggle and battle with the darkness until you die or he returns. No, I'm sorry. The Bible says under Jesus, the second Adam, I get to reign in life. Ephesians 2, he's seated in the heavenly places, and guess who's supposed to be right next to him? Us. Church. Especially those of us that live here. We got to get up off the mat of being defeated and having the darkness and oppression, and frankly, this is where we're going, our own open doors to sin, keeping us under the thumb of oppression and the weightiness of this region, under the inversion, when we're supposed to be seated in heavenly places, reigning. I am tired of feeling like the bride in Utah is languishing underneath an enemy that Jesus has already disarmed and defeated. And we just lay there and blame the attacks of the devil and act like he's still got all this power over us when most of what's holding us down is our own compromise, our own unrighteousness. So I told you today we were going to examine the righteousness of God and then we're going to let it examine us. We are here tonight to tear up some agreements and cancel some partnerships. What I'm saying is when you extend your hand to somebody in business and you make an agreement with someone, you become partners Oftentimes, a handshake becomes a contract, then it becomes a legal document. Agreement, what I'm trying to say is, agreement creates partners. As I returned from my paternity leave last week, I asked our staff team to give me a pulse of what they were seeing and sensing in our church body. There were a lot of beautiful things going on in our family. I'm very encouraged. God is moving. There are great things happening but there was some, something significant that was mentioned that probably won't surprise you, but it seemed really significant. And it was just kind of this recurring battle with sickness among our church body. Now, I understand that some of this is seasonal and we've got a bunch of little kids running around and they tell us that, oh, this is just normal. I guess it has become that this, some of this just could be seasonal. I get it. But... <clears throat> There seemed to be an invitation from the Lord to examine ourselves and look deeper. 
And God has been highlighting this scripture for a couple of months out of Luke 11. I want to read it and then contextualize this for us. Jesus said, no one after lighting a lamp puts it in a cellar or under a basket, but on a stand, so that those who enter may see the light. Your eye is the lamp of your body, your light source. When your eye is healthy, someone say healthy, your whole body is full of light. But when it is bad, your body is full of darkness. Therefore, be careful, lest the light in you be darkness. If then your whole body is full of light, having no part, someone say no part. part. Talking about partnerships. Having no part dark, it will be wholly bright as when a lamp with its rays gives you light. Okay, so I am speaking to our Salt Lake family here. So I come back from paternity leave, and I'm hearing about all this this recurring waves of sickness upon sickness and all this stuff. And I'm remembering Luke 11. Jesus said, if our eye is good, our body is healthy and full of light. And so as a good pastor and a good father of a family, we, I lean in with our team, and I say, guys, If there's something unhealthy about our body, maybe there's something unhealthy about our eye. And we spent the entirety of this week leaning in as a staff and elder team going, Lord, search us. Ephesians 5 takes this light and lamp thing a step further. And it's a flip to Ephesians 5 if you got your Bible. Hang in with me especially you Texas folks, I know you're tired. I promise you, if, if you can push through the next 25 minutes, this will mark you for the, the rest of your life. Yeah. Yeah. Ephesians 5 says, be imitators of God. Church, God loves righteousness. He hates wickedness. Be imitators of God. As his beloved children, walk in love. As Christ loved us and gave himself up for us, a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. Verse three. But sexual immorality and all impurity or covetousness must not even be named among you as is proper. In other words, as what you would expect, what is fitting among saints, which just means holy ones. Remember day one in the blood, he says, you're righteous. I took your righteousness problem away. You're righteous. Holy means set apart. Not even named. Let there be no filthiness, nor foolish talk, nor crude joking, which are out of place, not proper among saints. Instead, let there be thanksgiving. Watch where he goes with this. For you may be sure of this, that everyone who is sexually immoral or impure, or who is covetous, that is, an idolater, has no inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. Let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of these things, the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. So so no one that is partnering in these ways has inheritance. Remember, the the inheritance in the kingdom, the scepter of his kingdom, the scepter of his kingdom is the scepter of of righteousness. Remember, his righteousness is about his throne. His throne is the place of authority. What do sons get to inherit from their fathers? Their father's authority to do business. I believe that the church will never walk in the authority of God in a region that is our rightful inheritance as long as as we are still sexually immoral, impure, and covetous. He goes on. 
and says, therefore, do not become what, church? Partners. Partners. Every time you make an agreement, you form a... For at one time you were, past tense, darkness, but now you are light. Walk as children of the light. He's just saying, be who you are. For the fruit of the light is found in all that is good and right and true. That is the literal definition of righteousness, of what it means to be righteous. Good, right, true, clean, pure, straight. Walk as children of the light. Verse 10, try to discern what is pleasing to the Lord. Verse 11, look what he says again. Take no part. Say that with me. Take no part. Do you understand we're reading the New Testament? This is a new covenant grace message to a new covenant blood-bought church where they're children of God because of the blood of Jesus. This is an old covenant legal law. He's saying, Take no part in the unfruitful works of darkness. Instead, expose them. For it is shameful even to speak of the things that they do in secret. But when anything is exposed by the light, it becomes visible. For anything that becomes visible is light. I'm asking for us as a church family to examine our partnerships tonight to examine our hearts, to pray the the Psalm 139 prayer of search me and know me, and to look at Jesus who loves righteousness and hates wickedness, to look at his great salvation that day one called you righteous and set you apart to be a child of light and to honestly search our hearts and go, though I am a child of light, There's no condemnation for you in Christ. I hope you understand where this is coming from. God loves you. He is after your full, free, uncompromised heart because he wants to be intimate with you personally and with his bride corporately. But So he's after you in love. But if we have gone in, even though we're light, gone and made partnerships, agreements, yep, I'll click on that. Yep, I'll watch that. Yep, I know I was saved from that, but I'll do that. I'm telling you, it's that simple. This isn't rocket science. Every time we... The enemy extends the hand of temptation, which you have all the power in Christ, 2 Peter 1, to live a life of godliness and escape. He extends a hand of temptation. What you're empowered in Christ to do is say, nope, Child of light, why would I do that? That temptation didn't even come from inside of me unless some bogus preacher told you that you're still a wretched sinner and that all of your impulses come from inside of you. I'm telling you, the gospel says garbage. You're a child of God, righteous day one. Your temptation's coming from over here. So stop feeling all shameful every time he tempts you. That temptation has nothing to define you and actually has no power to mess with you unless you're lured over and make that handshake agreement. And then guess what? You just formed a legal contract with Satan who you've been set free from, and now he has legal right through this contract and agreement to torment you, oppress you, steal from you, destroy you, and keep you in a bondage that the blood of Jesus already broke. Finally, brothers, we ask you, 1 Thessalonians 4, that we urge you that as you receive from us how you ought to walk and to please God, just as you are doing, that you do so more and more. For you know what instructions we gave you through the Lord Jesus. For this is the will of God, your sanctification or your holiness, that you abstain from sexual immorality 
that each of you know how to control his own body in holiness and honor, not in the passion of lust like the Gentiles who do not know God, that no one transgress and wrong his brother in this matter. You think it's a secret, hidden, innocent sin that's not hurting anybody? Maybe you don't understand that you're connected to a body of Christ, an organism. And so you might think it's hidden and in secret, but it is affecting everyone you're connected to. Don't transgress your brothers in this matter because the Lord, I am still reading out of the New Testament, the new covenant of grace, The Lord is an avenger in all these things, as we told you beforehand and solemnly warned you. For God has not called us for impurity, but in holiness. Church, therefore, whoever disregards this, disregards not man, but God, who gives his Holy Spirit to you. You might notice that this is getting specific. We're called to love what he loves. We're called to hate what he hates. Some of us are stuck in legal agreements with things that God hates. And here's the good news. Right now, tonight, before you walk back out into this glorious Sunday, sunny evening in Salt Lake City, you get to rip up those contracts. You get to break those partnerships. If you got a journal or something, I want you to grab a blank piece of paper, rip it out of your journal, grab something. If you you don't have a journal, you need to borrow one from your neighbor, but I need you to get a physical piece of paper. Sorry, I'm not more prepared for this, okay? But maybe somebody can go grab a stack of computer paper from the office, all right? But I need you to get a piece of paper because this is about to be really tangible, okay? Because I'm going to ask us, church family, I am going to ask us to pray the search me and know me prayer. And if there's any contract we have made with darkness, hey, hey, friends, brothers, sisters, do you see I'm literally just preaching passage after passage of scripture and the Bible, not even me as your pastor, the Bible. Bible is saying, take no part, form no partnership. These things should not be named among you. Raise your hand if you need a sheet of paper, real quick. We're going to sit here for like 20 seconds, pen or a pen, raise your hand, paper or pen, paper or pen. We need a couple up here. Stay with me, stay focused here. Paper, pen. Okay. Beloved, I want to like just speak as a spiritual father. Some of this is not entirely, okay. Anytime you make an agreement, you extend the hand and you make a partnership, you need to know that is entirely your fault. (laughs) That's entirely your choice. And the only way for you to break that agreement is for you to entirely take responsibility for it and bring the blood of Jesus that severs contracts. It is your fault. (laughs) On the other hand, as a father, a pastor, some of The fact that you've stayed in these contracts is not your fault because you've had 
bogus, probably compromised church leaders or fathers that had their own contracts they didn't know how to break. And so all they preached to us for many, many years, men, I want to talk to you specifically for a second in this specific battle we've been highlighting in purity. Since I was in college at A&M 25 years ago, it's every man's battle. There are entire books devoted to telling you that it's every man's battle and that you're always going to stay in this battle and you're always going to struggle in this battle. And so I want to apologize to you on behalf of fathers and church leaders that sold you a false bill of goods that didn't preach to you the fullness of the deliverance message of the blood of Jesus and stood up before you and, and said, and, and I'm sorry you didn't have fathers that couldn't stand up before you and say with a pure heart, hey, it's not my battle anymore. I'm telling you. And I, I want you to hear me because I'm going to say some things pretty confidently, but I need you to know that it is only the blood of Jesus that made me righteous, the deliverance power of Jesus that set me free, and then me actually being around other men. This happened at Antioch College Station. For the first 10 years I walked with Jesus, I heard the every man's battle deal. You're just always gonna struggle, get an accountability group, just you know, try to keep a lid on it, confess it, you know, but you're just always gonna struggle, brother. It's every man's battle. And then I showed up at Antioch. And I start seeing spiritual fathers going, yeah, it's been eight years since I went online. And yeah, it's been 12 years. Can I tell you, hung out, got to have dinner with one of our elders last night, hanging out together, kids running around playing together. We're talking about this. 15 years. I said, when was the last time? When was the last time you went online and looked at something? 15 years. I'm telling you, it's not my battle anymore. We say, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation. And none of us believe that he'll actually answer that. I'm telling you, I cannot remember the last time that I was tempted to go online and look at that. I can't remember. Now, I'm not saying that I don't have to guard my eyes like all the rest of you guys, that there are not real moments, real moments where the enemy extends his hand in temptation. They are frequent. And I frequently have to remind myself, not with a perfect track record, but I have to remind myself, nope. And I get on the phone with one of my brothers. I want you to know something real quick. Worship team, uh, Matt, up to you. You can bring you and Shannon or the whole band up here, but I think we'll just pick up in the eyes of fire where we were unless you have something else great. But I think maybe we just continue that holy holy thing as we kind of respond. Um, wow, sorry. I just realized what time it is. Um, this is a moment that needs not be like rushed or missed. Um, at the same time, parents, we've told the kids workers that childcare cuts off at six. So as we start to respond, if, if you're good, uh, husband or wife, like maybe just go pick up your kids and we'll just let it be what it needs to be in here. Are we, are we okay? Okay, I want you to know, um, I really sense that tonight the Lord is, is bringing a fresh conviction. A fresh conviction of what he's calling us up into as the people of God. In breaking these partnerships. I'm gonna come back next week because there's a whole host. There is, uh, you know, 
okay, he gave himself for us on the cross so that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. So there's like a deliverance where you break partnerships and it's like, boom. And what you're gonna do in a minute as we respond is you're gonna write down any agreement you've made, any show you've watched, any compromising thing. Specifically, I want you to examine your eyes. What have you put before your eyes? Because it's the lamp of your heart. And if our eyes are good, our whole body will be healthy. But if there's things before our eyes, it's letting sickness in. So we can't really just lay here in this seasonal sickness thing, church body, and just blame everything on the devil. Where if we're actually looking at things that God hates, we're letting sickness into the body. I'm not saying it's a one-to-one thing and that if your family got sick a few weeks ago, it's because your husband has hidden sin. I don't know. It might be. Or your wife. Or it could be that your family got sick for the third or fourth time because someone else in this organism that you're connected to, I don't know how all that works. I just know we're a family. And that God says, don't wrong your brother in this matter. And so that means that my sin's not just bringing a doorway of death into my own life and family. It's bringing a doorway into anyone I'm connected to in the organism of Christ. So let that motivate you a little bit if you need some more conviction, friends. But I feel like tonight is a night of conviction. I'm gonna come back next week and I'm gonna give us some more practical equipping, okay? So don't, don't freak out. We're breaking contracts tonight. Come back next week, I'll teach you how to sustain it. I'll teach you how to say no to his garbage offer of temptation every time. There's a practical way to learn how to fight temptation. There's a practical way to learn how to take your thoughts captive. There's a practical way to learn how to confess sin and temptation. Are you with me? We're gonna unpack more of that. Tonight, I wanna finish in Revelation 2. Always at the front, Tony. You can stand if you're ready to stand. If you need to sit so you can journal and write, be free. Let's dim the house lights. The Holy Spirit speaks to a church in Revelation 2. The church of Thyatira. The words of the Son of God who has eyes like a flame of fire, whose feet are like burnished bronze. He says, I know your works. He encourages them. Your love, your faith, your service, your patient endurance, your latter works exceed the first. Oh, but I have this against you, that you tolerate that woman Jezebel, who calls herself a prophetess and is teaching and seducing my servants to practice sexual immorality and to eat food sacrificed to idols. I gave her time to repent, but she refuses. Friends, the only way you can miss this breakthrough, the only way you can miss canceling this contract tonight is if you refuse to repent. She refuses to repent of her sexual immorality. Behold, and I remind you, this is New Testament, New Covenant Gospel. The Spirit of God says to a church, I will throw her onto a sickbed, and those who commit adultery with her, I will throw into great tribulation unless they repent of her works, and I will strike her children dead. And all the churches will know that I am he who searches mind and heart. And I will give to each of you according to your works. My friends, my brothers and sisters, we cannot tolerate this. We cannot be in partnership with this. I say this to you that has been made righteous by the blood of the Lamb, that you have already been delivered from darkness as children of light. And we're going back and making agreements. And the scripture says it's time for judgment to begin with the household of God. We have no authority to confront the immorality in our culture if we are complicit in it and 
partnering with it. So let's get Psalm 139. I'm asking us to pray this right now. And I'm asking you to let God, your Father who loves you, I'm asking you to let your Father who disciplines you because He loves you, I'm asking you to let Him search your heart and know your heart, to try you and to know your thoughts and to see if there be any grievous way, any grievous partnership, and to lead you in the way everlasting. And every partnership and agreement or impurity that he speaks, I want you to write on that paper. And I want you to get ready in a moment as the Lord leads us to break that contract. This is a BC and an AD day for you, where you will look back and you will remember your life before March 10th, 2024, and then you will see your life after, unless you refuse to repent. I'm tired of having men's ministry gatherings every six months and opening up the altar for confession and repentance and the every man's battle and we're just sharing the same trash. It shall not be named among us. Spirit, you're the one that searches minds and hearts. You're the one that makes us holy, the one that made us holy. Jesus, you've called us to be holy as you're holy. You've called us not for impurity, but in holiness to be who you've already made us to be in your blood. Search us and know us, Holy Spirit. Shatter every agreement. Cancel every partnership. Listen to your Father who loves you. Let him show you. Let him flip on the searchlight of the Holy Spirit. Let him go through your heart and make it light. Let him shine on every little corner till there's no part dark.